I want to start with this, and, and, and I don't start with this quote um, because I'm not pandering, okay? I use this quote everywhere I go because it's from John Dyer, all right? So it's from John's book, um, From the Garden to the City, which if, if you haven't read that book, by the way, I, I'm not getting royalties. I should have talked to John about that. No, if you haven't read that book, awesome book, just kind of on the, the theology of technology, and it's a great book that, that your own John Dyer has written. But John uses this kind of as a, he uses this as a, a hey, let's, here's a starting point with a definition of technology. What is technology? Because it's, it varies. But John says this, he says, technology is a means by which we transform the world as it is into the world that we desire. What we, often to fail, what we often fail to notice is that it's not only the world that gets transformed by technology, we too are transformed. And I use that quote, and I want to start with that quote because I want parents and those who are, are leading kids and, and thinking about that to think about the transforming impact that technology has on their kids. And it's always been there. It's, it's not like this is a new thing. It's not like technology just is something that we are dealing with with this generation. Technology has always been with us. We're just at a very rapid uh, increase in technological advances and all the things that are going on. And so it does, it does impact us a little bit more, but let's think about that. Um, John also uses this verse in his book, and I love this verse because it's, it's a great way for us to think about technology um, from a biblical standpoint. Second John, uh, there's only one chapter, verse 12. I have much to write to you, but I do not want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to visit with you and talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete. What a great verse on technology. And, you know, a couple things just that come to mind as I think about that verse. Number one, technology has always been with us. And I am really thankful for technology in John's time and Paul's time, because we have the word of, of God, we have the Bible, we have the New Testament because of the letters that they wrote. Paper and ink were the technology of their days. That's awesome, I love technology, but even they recognized that technology was a substitute for what God ultimately designed us for, and that was community, that was face-to-face -face interaction. I, did, I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete. The challenge that parents and, and leaders of young people today have is helping students, helping kids recognize and develop in such a way that technology does not become the primary way that they communicate and interact with the world around them. We have to be very intentional about that today because left to their own selves, their own desires, most kids, not all kids, because they're all wired differently, but most kids are going to spend way too much time online. They're going to do way too much with social media, share way too much information, um, and they're not going to develop those skills necessary to have face-to-face -face interaction and communication. And so as parents in a digital age, that's what we've got to be intentional about, is creating those face-to-face -face moments creating those opportunities for them while we equip them with the technology that they're gonna be using for the rest of their lives. We don't, we don't just take technology away. We're not doing our job as parents if we do that. Our job as parents is to show them and teach them and model for them what it looks like to steward technology well going forward. And so that's what we're doing to equip them as opposed to just protecting them from the technology and the dangers that are out there. Let's equip them for the digital world they're gonna live in and be using the rest of their lives. Barna did a study, May of 2011, on the family and technology. And I just, I'm pulling this quote from this. Technology is shaping family interactions in unprecedented ways, but we seem to lack a strategic commitment to the stewardship of technology. They're talking here broadly about the church and the church's role with families. The Christian community needs a better, more holistic understanding of how to manage existing and coming technological advances. Parents, tweens, and teens need more coaching and input in order to face the countless choices they make regarding how technology affects their attention, interests, talents, and resources. 
Very true four years ago, all the more true today uh, as we continue to move forward in our advances in technology and, and our kids' use of technology. There, uh, soon there's not going to be a school in America that isn't issuing iPads or tablets to, to kids to read and learn on and take home with them. Um, it is the world that we live in, and, and what we need as a community is a strategy. And, and I love this report that pointed that out four years ago is that's what we lack. We lack a strategy. And so what I want to do is kind of walk through as a parent, kind of having just gone through this, if I were talking to a parent of a four or five year old, what strategies would I say? What, what are some key things that I think are important for families to think about uh, when it comes to this topic? So let's just talk about that, a technology strategy for families. One thing I want to note about when I say a technology strategy for families, I purposely did not say a technology strategy for kids, okay? When I talk about this with parents, I talk about a technology strategy for your home. This is for all of us. This impacts all of us. It's not just an issue with your kids. It's an issue with me. I remember my youngest son, who's now a freshman in college, when he was about 10, 10 or 11 years old, it was back in the Blackberry days, okay? I, I used, used a Blackberry back then. And I'm sitting on the couch with my Blackberry, and my 10-year-old son is sitting next to me on the couch. I don't know how long he'd been there, but he finally, in disgust, gets up, and he, said, he turns around, and he looks at me, he says, Dad, you're always on that thing, and walked off. I have no idea what I missed. I have no idea what he was going to share with me. <laughs> I don't know if it was really important or if it was no big deal. Whatever it was, I missed it because I was on my BlackBerry because he was disgusted with me. I was not doing a very good job of modeling for him good technology use. And so as I talk about these things, I talk about, hey, this is a strategy for us as a community. Yes, your kids are in this, but, but this, is a, this is bigger than that. So five, there's five things I want to lay out for you, and, and just we can talk about these. I'd love to talk about these at, at each point. Just get your feedback on this. Number one was, was, um, is education. And the reason I started there is because what I hear as I talk to parents around the country, and I hear this more and more, is man, my kids know so much more than I do. I, I can't keep up with everything that's going on. I'm, I'm not very tech savvy. And, you know, my kids got an iPad. They got a PlayStation 3. They've got an Xbox 360. You know, they've got an iPhone. They got all this. I can't keep up with all that stuff. So the first thing that I want to say to parents, all parents, is that, hey, this education process, what's going on in the world of technology is an ongoing thing. We are required. It is a requirement of us as parents that we stay up on what's going on. Yes, you may never know as much as your kids know. Yes, your kids are going to be smarter than you when it comes to this stuff because they're native to the world of technology. We're immigrants. <laughs> if you were born after you know, 1985, you were in, or before 1985, you are an immigrant to the world of technology. If you were born after that, you're a native. This comes natural to you. It does not come natural to the, those who are older than us. Um, so we, we've got we've to be diligent. We've got to educate ourselves. So just some, I'll just give you some ideas and some tools. One is um, the organization that I worked for for a number of years that I still do a lot of speaking for is Pure Hope. Purehope.net. Great resource. They do a Friday blog that is basically a compilation of all the news articles and, and information that they think are important to get out to parents. Hey, what's going on in the world of technology? What's going on in the sexualized culture that parents need to be aware of? And it's a great place on a weekly basis to get that, that updated information. Another organization that I've worked really closely with that I, that I have a lot of respect for is the Center for Parent Youth Understanding. This is Walt Mueller's group, if any of you are in student ministry, you know that name, Walt Mueller, um, Center for Parent Youth Understanding. They, they, I, I point parents to that and I point people to that just because 
I think they're doing a great job of keeping up with what's going on in youth culture and putting information out there for parents to stay on top of that. You know, what's going on with, I, they were the first ones, I think, two and a half years ago that I heard the word Snapchat and, and realized what Snapchat was. And, and they were, that's where I learned about Snapchat and, and how important that was. And, and by the way, I'm one of those people, when I hear about something like that and I hear people saying, get your kids off Snapchat, you know, danger and alarms going off, I immediately download it onto my phone. I, I know, it's weird, I'm one of those people. If it's not specifically pornographic or whatever that is, I wanna learn it. I, I just, I wanna know how it works. And so at the time, my daughter was about 17 years old, 18 years old, I guess, at the time. And we, good discussion, good dialogue. She was kind of my in-home um, guinea pig for stuff. I'm like, hey, have you ever heard of Snapchat? No, never heard of it. Download it on your phone. Let's figure it out. How does it work? So anyway, I say that. I don't make that a recommendation. I, I just let you know that's where I, I'm coming from. I love to figure these things out and how they work because here's the thing about all of the, the scary apps that are out there. A lot of them have legitimate uses and, and legitimate reasons for being. Now, the thing about Snapchat, when you, when, when you look at why it was developed and how it's marketed, it is specifically targeted to you know, teenage girls, young, young people. It was when it was developed. It's beyond that now. It's, a lot of people use it. But originally it was, hey, take a picture, send it, it disappears in you know, 10 seconds or whatever, and it's gone. And it was really trying to get people to, to take risque pictures. And, and that was what was behind it. But anyway, just that, that idea of what's new, what's going on out there? What are some sources for you as a parent, as a leader, for somebody who needs to be educated on this to get? Another one is, is not a faith-based organization, but it's one I point parents to, and that is Common Sense Media. I think they have some really good things, especially for parents who have young children. They kind of keep up with movies. They keep up with... Um, technology, things that are available for young kids, and they do reviews on it. They do warnings for it for parents. It's just, again, it's another tool in the toolbox of information when it comes to education. I mentioned the name Covenant Eyes before. Covenant Eyes is a, if you don't know about Covenant Eyes, it is a um, software accountability, internet accountability software. It, they're, they're a company, they're a for-profit company but they are run by believers. They are run by a great group of Christian men and women. I've had the opportunity to be at their place up in Michigan. It's a great group of people. But anyway, Covenant Eyes has a internet accountability software, which I have on my phone, I have on my tablet, I have on my laptop. It's a great product. We had it on all our computers, have it on all our computers at home. Really good. Um, they also have a blog, though, and they do some really good stuff on their blog. So I'd, I'd point you to that as well. It's all, another good tool. Um, one other thing, and, and just from a uh, kind of a research standpoint, McAfee does a really good job as well of keeping up with kind of some trends and what's going on with kids, what are kids doing online, and that sort of thing. So the, the McAfee blog there is good. Also just pointed you to a couple of free downloaded, downloadable resources on Covenant Eyes, Parenting the Internet Generation and When Your Child is Looking at Porn. Just two great tools that they've put out that are free downloads for parents, for youth leaders, um, all of that sort of thing that, that are available. So I'm going to have to ask a question I can see to, to get some response here. Does anybody else have kind of good information or good sources of this kind of information that we're talking about that you'd like to share with the group or websites you go to? My wife and I go to IMDB. I don't know what IMDB. Yes. It's a review, and it'll go through each major division of what to expect for the rating of movies, sexuality, language, violence. Awesome. And it's very detailed. Okay. Right. So IMDB is, is um, what he said. I just said that for the camera purposes so they could hear you. That's a good one. Yeah. Growing up, like, my family used plugged in online. Plugged in. Yeah. 
plugged in online? The same thing. Okay. It's just a blog, but also they go through technology. But they do music, movies, video games, yeah. anything. Okay. Well. Awesome. Yes. I've used uh, McAfee's Safe Eyes before. Safe Eyes. Uh, yeah. It blocks, the, uh, it blocks certain web pages, and you can help program to tell what, what to block and what not yeah. to block. So. Great. Yeah, we'll talk more about some of the, the protection pieces, but those, those, blogs, those blogs and some of those websites have great information on there. Yeah, absolutely. Those are good. I'll add those to my, my lists. Just um, a couple things. I shared this um, when I was at Jerry's class this summer. I shared this slide and some of these slides, just some statistics. This was a study done last year on teens and screens and, and just some very common findings, some things that they found. 59% of teens engage, engage with strangers online. One in 12 meet the online stranger in real life. 33% of teens feel more accepted online than in real life. 50% posted their email address, 30% their phone number, 14% their home address even though 77% know that what is posted online can't be deleted, and 80% have had a conversation with their parents about it. They still do it. 52% <laughs> have gotten into a fight because of social media, 50% have gotten into trouble at home, and 49% have regretted posting something. And then, although 90% believe their parents trust them to do what's right online, 45% would change their online behavior if they knew their parents were watching. 53% close or minimize their web browsers when their parents walk into the room. 50% clear history of their online activity. This goes back to that first strategy point of educating themselves. Parents need to understand some of these tricks, <laughs> some of these tools. Again, not that not because our, our, our desire is to build this impenetrable bubble. We cannot build the impenetrable bubble. But we do need to be pretty diligent about what's going on in our homes and in our environments for the sake of our kids. Because most parents don't realize these things are happening. Oh, I've told my kids not to post that stuff online. Really? They're doing it anyway. You know, I'm friends with some of my kids' friends on Facebook and on Twitter and and in, on Instagram. I see what they're posting. And, and we, we've just got to be really intentional about that with our kids and not just assume that, hey, I told them that that one time. But, it, but it's got to be an ongoing thing. We've got we've to continue to do that. Yep. All right, go down that path for a second. Okay. So being friends with your, friend, your kids' friends on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Yes. How much of that is being the helicopter parent? How much of that the, the kids are gonna run away from the social media because I'm doing that? How much of it is her friends wig out? Why is this old man wanting to follow me on Instagram? Yeah. How do you do that? Yeah, <laughs> how did I do that? And yeah, the, the thing about social media, number one, I get asked, one of the questions I get all the time is, hey, my kid's nine years old. Should I let them on Facebook, you know? And so my answer to that question, that's an easy one. What does Facebook say? No. <laughs> it's Facebook says no. You got to be 13, right? So, so there's number one. Number two is when, when what you as a parent do decide or when parents do decide to allow their kids to get on this, this media, they need to have that very intentional conversation. Most parents haven't had it. So most parents are coming at it from... My kids are already on, they're already doing some bad things, so now I need to step in and become their friends and be friends with their friends. And the kid feels totally violated. You don't understand my privacy. You know, they're upset and all of that. So here's a, I'm going to give two answers here. Here's a proactive one. If, if kids are not there yet, number one, parents need to have an agreement with them. Here's the agreement. Number one, Here's what you will and will not do online, and here are the consequences for, for going against that. Number two, if you join social media, I remember this. When my, when my daughter joined Facebook, back when she was yelling about having a, a, you know, a My, MySpace, and we were like, no way, and then finally said yes to Facebook, um, this was the agreement. Okay, yes, you can be on Facebook, but... I'm going to be on Facebook, and I'm on Facebook. You have to be friends with me. 
and you have to allow me to be friends with all of the friends that you have. And, so, you know, and it was the eye roll, the... <laughs> And yes, that was a helicopter, maybe, maybe would be perceived as kind of a helicopter parent moment. But what it was, was she had no idea how to use it, number one. I wasn't very good at it at the time, and I wanted to learn what was going on. I wanted to be in her world. And I learned so much more about her and her friends and what was going on in their lives through that than ever. It was, it was an education piece for me. And I never felt like I was overstepping her bounds because... That decision when she was 14 years old changed when she was 17 years old. I think what so many parents do is they want to hang on to this same level of control from age 12 to age 18 instead of having a plan to gradually release and let go of some of the control over time so that when that kid's leaving home, they're leaving home having made some decisions, having made some bad choices. The hardest thing as a parent that, I, that I've experienced, especially when it comes to this world, giving up some of that control, knowing that I was allowing consequences into my kids' lives and knowing that they were gonna do some stupid things, but letting them do it anyway. I wanted my kids to make those mistakes while they were still at home, while I still had a chance to speak into that. While I still had it, while, while my wife and I still had the opportunity to help them through some of those bad choices and bad decisions. Now, we did that within reason. I'm not saying we let you know, our daughter out till three in the morning and do whatever she wanted to do. I, not that. But her curfew changed every year. Her, the control that we had over her social media and our boys too changed every year. We didn't keep that same level of, of anticipation. Just like the story I, sh I shared at the end of, of chapel was to the point where we gave our oldest son his first laptop and we didn't put any protection on it. We didn't put covenant eyes. We didn't put filtering and software because we felt like we've given them the tools. We've modeled this for them. It is now their choices and they've got to be making good decisions and good choices. And fortunately for us, you know, that was one of the good choices. There, I, I, you know, people always share the good choices. I could share a whole bunch of bad choices our kids made too. That, was, that happened to be a good one that they made, but just understanding, you know, that this was something they had to deal with going forward and not mom and dad weren't going to be there to do it. I think some of the most destructive and horrible stories that I've heard from parents have been these high control parents whose kids go off, you know the story, whose kids go off to college and just go crazy. They've never been given any freedom. They've never been given control. They've never had a sense of ownership in anything, especially when it comes to technology. And then all of a sudden they got complete freedom. So they went from no freedom to complete freedom and, and things just go crazy. Things go hot. Not every kid makes that decision, but you hear about those all the time. One of the ministries that I, that I um, do some speaking for is Family Matters, Tim Kimmel. Um, it's his, his ministry, Grace Based Parenting. Tim's written a book that I read when my kids were really young, and I'm so glad I read it, and it's called The High Cost of High Control. And, and Tim kind of talks about that in the book where he talks about just what is the cost associated with parents who just have high control over their kids. And I, that book was just really helpful for me in, in coming up with a strategy and having the courage to let go of things, to let them experience some of the, the pain and difficulty and consequences. Those are great learning tools. One of the, one of the, the things, I'll, I'll share this real quickly. Um, one of the passages of scripture that I love that talks about that, I talk about how, hey, when, when your kids have made a bad decision, when they're suffering some of the consequences, or as, as I talk about in the, the parenting thing, I talked about those guardrails, when your kids bump up against those guardrails or sometimes blow through the guardrails, that is the most teachable time of any time that your kids will have. I, I think about Peter walking on the water to go meet Jesus as Jesus is, is coming with the, with the waves going and, and he calls Peter out there. Peter loses faith, right? And he, his eyes go off of Jesus and he starts to sink. Jesus reaches out and, and grabs him, 
right? In that moment, Peter's incredibly teachable. Jesus could have just picked him up, put him in the boat, dried him off, and then gave him a lesson. What the Bible says is Jesus reached down, said, why did you doubt? You know, it was a, he, he recognized that was a really teachable moment. Peter was really teachable in that moment. He needed Jesus. He needed his hand. And then Jesus puts him in the boat and, and dries him off. And I love that. That those are teachable moments. Those are opportunities for us to speak in where our kids are ready to hear it. And, and as a parent, I'd love to never have my kids suffer any consequences, but it's just not reality. It's not helpful for them. And I want them to experience some of those things at home so that we can walk through those things together so that I can speak into that so we can talk about how to avoid that happening again. I'm never going to get through five elements. I'm sorry. Let me, we're going to speed this up a little bit. Protect what you can. Again, this isn't a let them have everything. It's protect what you can. Recognize as a parent, you can't protect everything. Recognize that they're going to figure out passwords. They're going to figure out how to turn off filters. They're going to figure out how to get around stuff. Do it anyway. Just because your kids are going to figure out how to get around it doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it. Do it. Put up hurdles, put up obstacles, make it more difficult for them as much as you can, but do it. Parental controls. The, a simple thing like if a kid's got an iPhone, set the restriction setting on that phone. Put in some parental controls. If nothing else with your teenagers, turn off installing apps. What we did, and, and here's one of those moments of how we thought about preparing our kids to leave home and giving them more control. I used to, on the restriction settings on my kids' iPhones, I had installing apps and deleting apps turned off. They could, install, they could not install any app or delete any app until they came to me. When my kids got about 16 and a half, 17, kind of that, that between sophomore, junior year of high school, we turned back on installing apps, but I left deleting apps on. They couldn't delete apps, but they could install. One of, the agree one of the agreements that each of our kids had to agree to to get their iPhone, by the way, was this is mom and dad's phone that I get to use, and they have the right at any time to look at it. So if they installed an app on that phone, which they could, they could install any app they wanted to, they couldn't delete it. And so I had the right, and I did often, picked up that phone, kind of looked through text messaging and looked through apps that they had on their phones, and that was a way. Hey, you have the freedom now to install any app you want to. But I may pick it up, and we're going we're gonna to have conversations. I have many conversations with them about apps on their phones that I didn't know what they were. Hey, what, tell me about this one. What's this? Kik? K-I-K? What is that one? By the way, that app alone, how many of you know what Kik is? You don't know what Kik is? Kik, I, Kik has been responsible for me flying emergency flights to Christian schools all over the country more than any other app. <laughs> and I got some awful stories about that just because kids are misusing that app. Um, it's, it's a lot of child predators use that app and draw kids into conversations, draw kids into um, meeting them discreetly. Again, Kick is one of those apps that has a lot, I think 80% of Teenagers have kick on their phone. It's something, it's crazy. It's one of the most popular apps out there. K-I-K, if you want to look at it. Um, but it's one of those that has a really dark side too. And it's one that parents need to know about. Hey, if your kid's got kick on their phone, you should know about it. And you should ask what it does. And you should, should try to figure out why they have it on their phone and how they're using it and have a conversation with them about it. Filtering and monitoring, we talked about. Um, just covenant eyes, safe eyes, some of those different things. And here's the, the one that I really highly recommend for all homes, all families, is that the router protection. Protect at the router level. Because you're going to have, like we did, kids coming in and out of your house all the time who aren't going to have parental controls, who aren't going to have filtering and monitoring on their devices that they bring into your house, that they're going to connect wirelessly. Let's have, them, let's have it set up at the router level to have some protection on there. So a couple there, um, just uh, opendns.com is a great tool for families. They have a plan called Family Shield, and it's a free service for families, but OpenDNS is awesome, opendns.com. Uh, SkyDog is a router you can actually buy 
that has all of this stuff preset and it, and it will limit activity on devices. It's, it's got some great features to it. And that's actually a router that you purchase and put in your home. So a couple ideas there. And I always remind here, you know, parents, stay alert, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. Prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Where is that verse more applicable and where is it more appropriate and useful for us than in the world of technology with our kids? There is so much out there that they can get in trouble with. There's so much that the enemy wants them to click on and, and see and, and do. And we just got to stay alert. We got to watch out. We got to be educated. We got to protect what we can. This is a great reminder for us that we need to do that. So managing screen time, when I'm talking about screen time, I'm talking about every device. Parents need to have a plan for managing screen time, for limiting activity on there. I show this, Michael Rich from Harvard Medical School just says this, worry is we're raising a generation of kids in front of screens whose brains are going to be wired differently. Now, I, I say that quote, and, and some people take it negatively, it's not necessarily a negative statement, but just recognize that kids' brains are being wired differently. That they're not learning the same way we learn. They don't socialize the same way we socialize. Their brains are being wired differently than ours. Not necessarily good, not necessarily bad, just different. And so we've got to take that into account. We've got to go going back to that first John or that second John verse. You know, we gotta, we got to keep the face-to-face -face in front of them. We've got to be intentional about that. So managing screen times, encouraging daily limits on screen time for kids and parents. Encouraging face-to-face. -face. So in other words, if I'm going to limit the amount of time my kid can be on screens, I want to really encourage that that rest of that time be used for face-to-face -face interaction. How do I set that up for them? Let's give them something to replace what we've taken away and let's set up opportunities for face-to-face -face interaction. Whether that's a family game night or whether that's, hey, let's have a party, you know, and invite your friends over and it'll be a no-tech party. I saw that idea the other day where, where this, these parents were having a party for their teenagers and there was a box at the front of the house and it basically said, let's, let's have a party with the people in this room. You know, because otherwise, kids are all going to be texting all their friends about how much fun they're having at the party, right? <laughs> so it was just a you know, kind of a no-tech party for, for friends, just encouraging that face-to-face. That -face. There's some creative ideas. Scheduling rest. Scheduling rest for ourselves and for our kids. And a couple of ideas. A um, couple of these I've stolen. One or two I've used in my house. One is a tech basket. Just having a place in your home, it doesn't have to be a basket, it could be a box, whatever. Just a place in your home where we have a no technology policy. So I, one couple that I know had a basket in their uh, kitchen on their island in their kitchen. And at dinner time, all phones, everything, technology went in that basket. Eight o'clock at night, after eight o'clock, all the phones, all the technology went in that basket. It was a physical reminder. And typically, dads, we did this for a while in our home. I, I had to be the first one to put my phone in there. They were not going to put their phone in there until they saw dad. And typically, you know, especially, not to pick on my daughter, but she was just, you know, the one who, would, this was a challenge for us more than the other two. You know, her, hers was, hey, it's, it's 8 o'clock, it's 8.01, it's 8.05. You know, it's like, it was like to the last second. Then finally, you know, the, the last text message got sent. And then it was kind of the, oh, you know, yeah, you're going to get the eye roll. You're going to get it every night. We've been doing this for two years. You can still roll your eyes. We're still going to do it. But just having that, that physical reminder because of that tech curfew. Having a time in your home for us, for your kids, where, hey, we turn off technology. The idea of cell phones, computers, televisions, and bedrooms, not a good idea. Again, this is a strategy for homes, I think. And, and as we model good technology behavior, and, and going back to that Barna study, how do we be good stewards of this? We need to be good stewards of rest. When my phone's buzzing all night while I'm asleep, I don't rest well. 
When my kids are laying in bed at three o'clock in the morning getting texts from their friends who were up, it's not a good, not a good Sabbath idea. It's not good rest. They're not getting rest. You know, you hear about bullying all the time, right? Cyberbullying. It's happening everywhere. Bullying's out of control with our kids. Bullying is not out of control. When I was a kid, bullying happened all the time. But the difference was when I was a kid, at three o'clock in the afternoon, until nine o'clock the next morning, I wasn't bullied. I had freedom from that. If they wanted to bully me, they had to call me on the phone, talk to my mom first, <laughs> and then get me. <laughs> Today, the bullying is happening from nine o'clock to three o'clock at school, and then it's happening from three o'clock to nine o'clock the next day online. Yeah, it's out of control. We need to help our kids get some rest and get away from that. We need to, that's, the, the, the curfew idea is, is a great one because we need to help them understand. They don't know that. They're natives to this world. People get bullied all the time, right? 24 hours a day. No. We're going to have a, we're going to have a tech-free time where you're going to rest and, and not have to do that. A tech Sabbath. What a great idea. Just the idea of, of, hey, what would it look like for you and I to take a weekend off? No technology, not wired, unplugged. What a great idea for us. I, last year, um, the organization that I was working for, we had, we had a prayer day once a month. And what, it was really cool. It worked out really well because I made that day every month my tech Sabbath. So I had a built-in one day a month tech Sabbath. It was awesome. That, that time for me of connecting with God, of not having my phone buzzing and, and checking email, just that one day a month was so refreshing. We did this as a family a couple of times, and I, and I encourage families all the time to do this. Ours were usually disguised as a camping trip, and it was usually because my kids love to camp. So we'd usually be on the road getting it, packing up. Hey, I got a great idea. Let's not take any of our devices, you know. So we would, we would leave our devices in the glove compartment or leave them at home or whatever and just have a weekend as a family with no technology. We're, there were, there were going to be no cell phones, and it was kind of a trade-off. Yeah, okay, we'll go camping. We'll go away this weekend with the idea that there's going to be no technology this weekend. And it was the great time of connections for our families. So this fifth element, keeping in mind this idea that our job as parents, our job as leaders of the next generation is equip them to thrive in a digital world. I mentioned this before. I do, um, I do a lot of speaking with different groups. There are some groups that I speak to, and I won't mention any names or any type of uh, category that would, would say this, but I will say some of the groups that I go to, I know are going to have the mentality of we're building this bubble around our kids. We're going to make sure they're in this school. We're going to make sure they don't associate with that crowd. I know when I talk to that group, it's going to be really, this is a point I'm going to hit hard with them. Your job as a parent is not to build the impenetrable bubble around your kids. Your job as a parent is to prepare your kid and equip your kid to leave your house stewarding technology, stewarding this gift of our sexuality, all of those things, doing that well. If you build the bubble without equipping, failure. That's where things are going to fall apart. If a parent says at this point, you know, or thinking in their mind, and I've had this, I've had parents come up to me after a technology talk, oh, we don't do cell phones in our house. We just, we don't, let kid, we don't let our kids have cell phones and we're not going to let them have cell phones. There's too much bad that can come about. I feel so sorry for that kid. That kid's going to be using an iPhone or a cell phone the rest of their lives. The real world demands that. Those parents have done nothing to prepare those kids for the world they're going to live in. So this idea, we've got we to have in mind, we've got to protect them, protect what we can, Educate them, let them suffer some consequences, but we got to be preparing them for this digital world that they're going to live in. To make choices and decisions today while they're at home where we can speak into those things. And yes, it's going to cause conflict. Yes, it is, but it's worth it. It's part of equipping them. There are no perfect parents. There is one perfect parent, and his kids rebelled. 
Protect, model, equip. It's a threefold strategy for parenting in the digital age. Protect, but don't stop there. Model, teach your kids what it looks like to steward technology well. Teach them what it looks like to rest from technology. Teach them what it looks like to prioritize face-to-face -face interaction instead of just asking that of them but not modeling it for them. And then finally, equip them. Equip them to thrive in the digital age. I'm done with my slides. Those are the five things that I, that I think are important for parents to understand when it comes to just a strategy with technology. Most parents, the majority of parents, and the majority of my parenting was reactive parenting. What we need to be teaching and, and encouraging parents is proactive parenting. What does it look like to proactively parent? How do we get out in front of some of these things? How do we prepare for what is coming down? And, and how do we talk to people who have been through it and know and who can help us design this? And, and that's what I hope this has been. Is as, you, as you prepare for either parenthood or maybe you are a parent or you're preparing for parenthood or even if you're just preparing to lead the next generation, this issue of technology is going to be with us. Uh, it's not going anywhere. It's not going away. It's not going to lessen. We've got to be diligent. We've got to figure out a strategy to do this well and steward this great gift well. So with that, let's just spend the last couple of minutes in conversation. Questions, thoughts, ideas, whatever you have. Great. Yes. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so I have uh, three kids that are all under the age of eight. And, uh, and also, I just want to say thank you so much for being here. And this, this is, like, so great for me Good. personally. Um, thank you. I wanted to see if maybe you would um, elaborate a little bit on, as you're in, beginning this conversation with children at this early, early age, yes. um, how do you and your wife manage the roles uh, with children of different genders? Okay. Uh, I have daughters and a son. So if you just kind of maybe sure. talk about – and also – uh, you know, how do you really, uh, do you talk to them differently or is it the same and, you know? Great. Awesome. I, here's, here's, I get at, one of the things, and I'll kind of couple this, your question with another one. One of the questions that I get asked more often than any other question is, hey, when should we start talking to our kids about sex? That's probably the number one. I never come out and answer that question, but I answer it with a question. Don't you hate when people do that? Answer a question with a question. But here's the question, number one, just, just and, I, and I'll get to the gender piece of that. When, as you're thinking or, or people are thinking about, at what age should I start talking to my kids about sex? Ask yourself this question. At what age does the world start talking to my kids about sex? Now you have a choice, okay? Your choice is, do I want to be letting the world talk to my kids about sex without me talking to them about sex? Or do I want to be out in front of that and before they get inundated with all of these lies, all of these stories that culture is going to try to shape, I want to get in front of that and I want to craft this story. I mentioned that you know, with my kids, it was around seven or eight years old that we decided to start having these conversations. And the one answer to your question, or at least give you a picture of what, what we did with our kids. We had, a, we had a situation, mom and dad in home, and that's not the situation in every home. But I think in an ideal situation where there is a dad and there is a mom and there's boys and girls, dad should be the primary communicator to the boys, at least initially. And mom ought to be the primary communicator to the girls, at least initially. And when I say the primary communicator, as you begin this story, the, the, the story is God's story. Um, the recognition that they are sexual beings, that, that God has made them this way. It doesn't mean that I talked to my seven-year-olds and gave them the whole story, the same story that I gave them at 15 or 16 or 17. What it meant was at age seven, I started telling the story. At age seven, I started giving them kind of the, hey, here's, here's what God has designed. Here's what his word says about this topic. And for my boys, I was the primary communicator with that. 
and my wife with my daughter. As they got a little bit older, 9, 10, 11 years old, we really kind of switched that a little bit because I wanted my daughter to have a male perspective as she was getting ready to go into middle school of the male mind. <laughs> my wife could have talked about that, but she couldn't have talked about it firsthand. I could. I could talk about it firsthand. So I wanted to give her a perspective, a male perspective. And I wanted my boys to have a female perspective. I wanted them to hear from their mom what, you know, the, her interactions with guys and her interaction as a female image bearer of, of how that impacted her. And I wanted them to see it from that side. I definitely think if you have the opportunity, both parents ought to be in conversation. Initially, I think dad with sons, mom with daughters, but, but over those, it's an 18-year sex talk. It's an 18-year sex talk. And if parents wait until their child is 16 and they haven't had the talk, okay, it's a two-year sex talk. It's not a one-time talk. It's an ongoing conversation. And what that means, too, is when my daughter's sitting next to me on the couch when she was a teenager and we're watching the Cowboys game, you know, and the cameraman decides to fixate on the cheerleaders for a little too long and I flip the channel. The sex talk, the 18-year sex talk, makes a comment about that. Says something about identity. Says something about modesty. Says something about what these, this girl is projecting. And then it flips the channel and goes back. And then it doesn't say anything. But it speaks into the moment, the teachable moments. It looks for opportunities to, to talk about God's purpose, God's design, how God, God has planned this. And then same situation, my boys are sitting on the couch next to me watching the same Cowboys game. The same thing happens, and I flip the channel, and I say something. And for me, that typically is this. Hey, guys, do you know why I changed the channel? And what they're expecting me to say is, because you guys don't need to see this. When I change the channel, when something like that happens and they're sitting there, what I say to them, I change the channel because I don't need to see that. I'll go to bed tonight and have that image in my mind, and I'll fixate on that. And so, yes, I don't want them to see that, but, the, but I want to model this for them. And that's a good price. I, I change the channel because I don't need to see that. And so... When I, when I say a conversation too, don't think traditional conversation where, okay, seven, done, you know, now I don't have to do it. It's, hey, have I talked about this this week? Have I spoken into this moment? 14,000 messages these kids are hearing every year. They're hearing all kinds of stuff. I need to speak into that regularly, often. Have an opportunity, look for an opportunity. God will pray for opportunities. God will tee you up. Turn on, turn on pop music today and, and talk about some lyrics. Teachable moment, opportunity to speak into God's design and purpose and how that differs from, from what he's designed them for. Other questions? A good resource for talking to your kids, there's some books yes. by Stan and Brenna Jones. Awesome. Those are great um, books. God's Design for Sex is series. It's a great book. There's a book by Randy Alcorn called The Purity Principle. It's a short read, really easy read. That's a great book. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of other auth authors. One is Jim Burns. Uh, Jim Burns has written a book, Teaching Your Children Healthy Sexuality. Great book written from a Christian perspective. And then there's a book, Denny Burke has written a book called The Meaning of Sex. It's a, he wrote it within the last two years. It's a great book talking about the story of sex, if, if that's a book you're interested in. Thank you, Jerry. Yes? Okay, um, my question is in regards to the fact that for many of us, um, kids in our church, uh, youth in our church, families in our church, working with them is gonna be a much more present reality than having kids of our own. Yeah. And so my question is how do we as people who are going into the church and going to be ministering there, how do we help families and kids become equipped when we can't be there to yeah. look, you know, check the settings on their phone and, uh, you know, say, okay, we're going to have a, tech, a technology Sabbath, things right. like that. How do we help them get equipped yeah. for this digital um, yes. 
this, yeah, this digital time that we're living in? It's a, it's a great question. Um, and here, here's kind of my view on student ministry, and uh, this may be way off, but I'm, I'm a little bit biased because I've been in the parenting world for so long and kind of parenting ministry. I really see student ministry, good student ministry, as being a partnership with parents, more so than a direct ministry to the student. Um, as much as you can do for students and programs that you can put together and individual one-on-one -on -one discipleship, those are all awesome. But if you can equip parents to do those things, if you can equip parents as a student pastor, you know, if you can equip the parents to do these things, they're going to be with their kids a lot more than you are. They're going to be with them a lot longer than you are. And they're going to be with them for the rest of their lives, probably more than you are. I think our best way and our best approach in partnering with students and getting this into families is to partner with parents. And parents are hungry for this stuff. Pa every parent in America is dealing with the challenge of technology. Every parent doesn't know what to do. Uh, there's very few that are well-equipped or feel well-equipped, especially in the church. And so my encouragement to you would be partner with parents. Tee up conversations with your students for parents. Hey, have you talked to your parents about that? It would be real easy for a kid to come to you, a 13-year-old or a 14-year-old girl or boy, whatever it might be, whatever students you work with, and they ask you a question. Encourage them. Hey, have you talked to your parents? I bet your parents would love to talk to you about that. You know, as opposed to... I think the easy thing and the natural thing for many of us is to answer the question. I want to give them the information. But think to yourself, could this be better if the parents were delivering this? The answer might be no. <laughs> I mean, you know the parents. But if that, if that kid's in a good situation, the answer might be, this would be better coming. Let me encourage this kid to talk to the parents. And then to even say to the parents, hey, have you, had a, have you talked to your daughter recently about you know, relationships or anything, she, you might want to might bring that up, you know, just to kind of facilitate that where you can. That, I, I don't know if that answered your question, but that's my thought on it. I really think the parents need to be equipped in this, and, and that, that can be one of the roles that, that student pastor, student ministry people help with. Um, I've encountered teenagers who are telling me uh, and their parents go to church, that their parents are okay with them like visiting their boyfriend or moving in with their boyfriend. How do I speak into their life? <laughs> that's, a, that's that situation where, again, knowing the parents and knowing where they're coming from, um, you know, I, you certainly don't want to throw parents under the bus, and you certainly don't want to um, do that. But, but again, it's, it's about making sure that our kids understand God's story of sex. You know, you know, when you think about some of the tough questions, what's the big deal with living together? You know, it's a great opportunity for, for us to figure out if we love each other, if we're going to work out, if we're compatible. That's very common sense. That's what the world says. That's what they should know. Why? But, but if we can give them the tools of why that that is not God's plan and why it's outside of his purposes. And why is sex sacred? That's the, that's the big question that we need to answer for our world around us. What's the big deal? That proclamation piece, that proclamation piece, when I went through the four Ps, you know, the, the, the pleasure, the protection, the procreation, that proclamation, sex is a big deal because we are image bearers of God. God is not unfaithful. God does not tolerate and cannot tolerate immorality and sexual immorality and fornication and how all of those things tie into that because that's not who he is. That's not what he designed us for. We're image bearers of his. You're a female image bearer. Or you're a male image bearer. And you've got to live out what God's plan and purpose is for your life in order to thrive. Um, where they're hearing different stories from their parents, you know, that's where you're going to have to speak up probably more than, than you would if the parents were, were in agreement. Thank you very much for this um, discussion. You know, 
My question is, I'm being curious. You know, I'm coming from a society where sex education is like a taboo. Yes. Yeah, parents never talked about sex. And I'm also an up-and-coming parent. Very soon I'll be a parent. So I want to ask, you know, how does it, um, like, can you give me a summary of how to start, or the first day if you are having a sex conversation with your child, how, how are you going to start it? Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I'll say this, okay, because this is what I, what I typically see. The vast majority of parents today, in today's age, the first time they have a conversation with their kids about sex is because their kids have seen pornography. I would say 95% of evangelicals, so, and, and don't quote me on that percentage, I'm guessing here. <laughs> I don't have the statistics to back that up. Just based on my years of, of kind of talking to parents, it's, man, I wish, you know, I wish we'd have started this conversation earlier because he just saw porn or she just saw porn and now we're having to get into this conversation. As opposed to being seven or eight years old and talking about the issue of modesty. Hey, you know, we, we don't show our body parts. God's given you this body part, you know, as a male or a female image bearers. We don't show that to other people. Other than mommy and daddy and the doctor, you know, we can have those conversations at two and three years old. If nothing else, think of it this way. We want to communicate God's design and purpose for sex to our kids. I've, I've talked to young girls. I talked to a 13-year-old girl one time who came up after a session where I was speaking to students, and she said to me, she said, if somebody would have told me this, and I would have known this was wrong for somebody to touch me this way, it would, have, it would have been, my life would be different. Part of the reason that we need to talk to our kids about this early, if we don't, one in four girls, 25% of girls are sexually abused before the age of 18. What if we had these conversations with them and said, hey, we don't keep secrets in our house. If somebody in our family, I don't care who it is, if daddy or mommy says we, we're keeping this secret, we don't keep secrets in our house. The majority of sexual abuse cases come with trusted family members or friends. They're not the guy in the trench coat down at the park. It's people in our own homes that we allow into our homes that we trust. That's where the vast majority of sexual abuse happens. We need to be preparing our kids for this at two and three years old. At two and three years old, we talk about body parts. We talk about privacy. We talk about appropriateness. We talk about, at, and beginning around age four and age five, when they're on our iPads and playing on our iPads, and 90% of first-time exposure to pornography is accidental. That, you can't quote me on that stat. 90% of first-time exposure to pornography is accidental. If we have not had any conversations with our kids and we're letting them on technology, the first sexual thing that they encounter is pornography. And it's not the kind of pornography that you and I maybe saw when we were kids. Kids today, the type of pornography that they're seeing is crazy, is stuff that I've never seen, never want to see but they're, they're being exposed to this accidentally. So we talk about those things very young. Then, if we're reading the Bible and Bible stories with our kids, unless we're gonna skip over some hard parts, we need to address those things. We need to read the Song of Solomon to our kids. We need to read those verses of the beauty of God's sex, the beauty of the story. And we need to talk about it in this context. God is not afraid to talk to his kids about sex. He started in Genesis and he talks about it all the way through Revelation. And we need to, be, we need to understand that he doesn't, he doesn't shy away from this topic. And, and so we, we can't either. What you say to a three, four, five-year-old is very different again than what you say to a 13, 14, 15-year-old. But you begin crafting that story at that age. Sexual beings, your two-year-old, your three-year-old, your baby that you bring home from the hospital is a sexual being. Created that way on purpose and that's God's plan for them and God's purpose for them. The, the, I'll, I'll say this final thing and then, then we can go. 
The church today needs to be about raising strong kids, not safe kids. We need to raise kids who are equipped to enter this world, this, this sexual, over-sexualized world. We don't do that by keeping them safe. We do that by raising strong kids. And that takes courage. It's easier to not have to address these things by, by sticking our kids in a closet and, and trying to build the bubble, but it's not going to help them. It's not going to prepare them. What we need to be doing is building strong kids. Parenting not with fear, but with grace. I've loved being here. This has been great. I'd love to keep the conversation going. Um, connect with me on social media, whatever. Uh, if you're on Kick, I have Kick on my phone. I have Snapchat on my phone. All of that, um, let's, let's figure out a way to connect. I'd love to keep. Can I just pray for us and then we'll, we'll get out of here. Father, you are, you are a good God. You know us so much better than we know ourselves. Father, you have given us the manual. You've given us protection. You've given us so much. And Father, we are so thankful for your good gifts. Most of all, we thank you for Jesus, our Redeemer, our Savior, the one who sets us free, the one who purifies us as he is pure. Father, give us wisdom as we speak into the next generation, as we participate in raising and we participate in discipling the next generation. Help us to do that well. Help us to do it with a better story, with your story. We thank you and we praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen.